As the whole world goes rugby mad this month, Grandma is going on a very unusual adventure to discover how the game got its name. And it's not how most people think, she says. Most people believe rugby was invented in 1823, when William Webb Ellis, a pupil at a school in the town of rugby, caught the ball during a game of soccer and started to run with it, tucked under his arm. But that's just rugby folklore, isn't it? She says. Nevertheless, the story has stuck, and that boy's name, the one who ran with the ball, is now engraved on rugby's most important trophy. So, Grandma is travelling back in time to discover what really sparked the game with the oval ball. But not to 1823. It's 26 years earlier, and William Webb Ellis hasn't even been born. She has taken a job as a cobbler, making and repairing shoes. The shop is just across the road from Rugby Boys School in the heart of England. But the shop is in a total mess. Can you help her to sort out the shoes into matching pairs? Match the pairs of shoes by dragging them into the correct place. Well done. You've tidied up the shop just in time before an important customer walks in. Are my shoes ready yet? Asks the gentleman abruptly. The name's Ingle. Grandma finds Mr. Ingle's shoes and realises from the label that this is none other than the headmaster of rugby school. Mr. Ingle is known for being very strict and not liked by the boys at all. He insists that they spend all their time studying Greek and Latin and says there's no place for sports or general playtime whatsoever. Rather nervously, Grandma starts wrapping his shoes when suddenly there's a crash as the window shatters and a cork pellet ricochets off the shelves. For a moment, the headmaster freezes and then he flings open the door and storms out towards a group of boys standing by the school gate. The boys have been left to their own devices after lessons and got up to some serious mischief. They are crowded round a gangly lad who is holding an old flintlock pistol. Fire it again, shouts one of them. And another cork pellet shoots off, this time breaking a school window. The headmaster is furious and demands to know where they got the gunpowder. Mr. Wall sold it to us, replies the terrified boy, pointing at the local shopkeeper. But the shopkeeper immediately denies any involvement and convinces the headmaster he didn't sell them the gunpowder. The headmaster takes his word for it and the boy is dragged off to be punished. Grandma will need to investigate and find out who is telling the truth. Visit the shop and see if you can find any traces of gunpowder there. Check the contents of each jar by holding it over the candle. Is there anything suspicious there? exclaims Grandma. This isn't tea, it's gunpowder. So the boys were telling the truth. She rushes back to the school to speak in defense of the boy, but it's too late. He's already been punished. The other boys are outraged that the headmaster has taken the shopkeeper's word over theirs and go wild at the injustice. They quickly take revenge and blow the doors off the headmaster's office with the remaining gunpowder. The whole school is descending into chaos. In the main courtyard, boys are hurling tables and chairs and books from the upstairs windows. Everything is being piled up and set alight while the boys are running around like lunatics. The headmaster's only answer is to call on the local soldiers for help. And then he barricades himself into a classroom for safety. 
As the soldiers rush through the school gates, Grandma tries to explain what's happening. Things have got a little out of hand, she says. The soldier in charge directs his men to put out the fire. Can you lend a hand? Tap on the soldiers rapidly to beat down the flames. Keep going until the fire is out. Phew, that could have been dangerous. The whole school could have gone up. Grandma ushers the soldiers to where the headmaster is hiding. The boys are revolting, shouts the headmaster. Well, they can be a little unpleasant, but... No, no, they're staging a revolution, a rebellion. They must be stopped. By now, the boys have scarpered and set up camp on an old burial mound in the school grounds, which is surrounded by a moat. Convinced they're out of reach from the soldiers, the boys shout and jeer at the headmaster as he reads them the riot act. But while the boys are distracted, some of the soldiers wade through the water and take the students by surprise. And they quickly overcome the rioters. The rebellion is over. And order is restored. The punishments are severe. The ringleaders expelled from the school. But what has all this to do with the game of rugby, I hear you cry? Well, after a day or two, when things have settled down, the boys are bored again with nothing to do in the afternoons. Grandma has returned to the cobbler's shop, repairing some shoes, when one of the schoolboys comes in. Is it possible to make us a ball to play with, please? He asks. It seems the headmaster has relented slightly on the no ball games rule, because he'd prefer they used up their energies in less destructive ways. And Grandma, using her leather sewing skills, is happy to take on the boys' order. The boys have organized themselves into two teams as she throws them the new ball. Make sure you keep it fair and orderly, insists the headmaster, much to the boys' surprise. And the boys duly respond that they're playing by proper rules that they've agreed between themselves. Can you help Grandma pick out some of the new words and terms the boys are using? Search through the letter square to find some of the words used in the new game. It was these rules devised by the boys to entertain themselves in the afternoons that became known as the Rugby School Rules. In the years that follow, the rules get passed down by word of mouth for almost 50 years, until 1845, when three senior pupils at the school decide to write down the regulations of the game line by line. When they finish, three days later, the book is sent to the printers and every student at the school is issued with their very own copy. As the pupils graduate and move on, so they spread the word and excitement for their newly created game, rugby football. Wherever they ended up, in whatever part of the world, they'd return to their rule book to ensure that the game was played fair and square. Finally, in 1871, 74 years after the school rebellion, a new officiating body for the sport, the Rugby Union, was established in London to oversee how the game gets played. Which was a good thing too, as the very first international game was played the same year between England and Scotland. It would have been utter chaos without a common set of rules, says Grandma. So you could say 
It is thanks to a bunch of mysterious pupils from rugby school over 200 years ago for the international tournament we know today. As 20 teams from around the world compete in this month's tournament, can you create a poster in support of your favourite team and send it to Grandma?